Father, we thank you today as, as we are entering the end of summer, Father, as we are watching things begin to shift uh, in our natural surroundings, Father, we also sense a shift in the spirit. We sense a shift in our world and uh, politics. And uh, we look to you, Lord, to give us wisdom and understanding to guide us to keep us in peace as we wait for the coming of our Messiah Yeshua, our Savior, our Lord, God, and King. In Jesus' name, Shem Yeshua. Amen. So the uh, title today is Changing the Changing Season. And we're at the point where the summer is, you know, winding down and school is getting ready to start. And the county, county fairs are almost done. And I'm watching the, the farmers cut down all the foliage that's left in the fields and uh, getting it ready to put it to bed for the winter. Yeah. And for us, we've already, you know, begun to turn our hearts toward the high holy days. It's just a natural thing for us. And, uh, you know, we are almost to the month of Elul, the time of Teshuvah. And I know as a child, you know, even before I knew anything about the high holy days, I guess maybe it was because of school. But for some reason, this time of year, September, um, was the beginning of my year. So my, my cycle, my life cycle was from September to September. So the change of season can be environmental, but it can also be a season of life. So there's always a a natural change of season that we can depend on. But sometimes we enter a new season, new season of life, and the realization of that can kind of catch us off guard. So uh, this past month, you know, we hired a, a caregiver to help with my daughter. And uh, I've cared for her basically alone for 38 years. But uh, now I have help. And I realized when I actually did it, when I actually hired the lady, even before she came, uh, it just like hit me, like I said, kind of caught me off guard that I had entered into a new season of my life. And it was a little daunting acknowledging that because I, I saw it as a time of my life where I'm weaker and I needed the help. And so I had to admit, you know, that I wasn't you know, as strong as I used to be, and uh, that it was taking a toll on my body, because I'm getting older, and, um, you know, our health begins to take a dip, you know, we, we enter into an, an age time, and uh, we, we would love to continue on the way we used to, but mm -hmm. things change, and so God you know, brings us into different seasons as well, and uh, we may not always be prepared for it, so in Ecclesiastes chapter three, at first one, it says to everything, there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time of peace. So in life, it is never all good, nor is it all bad. Yahweh balances our lives with positives and negatives, with joyful things and painful things, pleasant things and hard things. Our family lost Meg's dad this year, and yet there's a balance with a new baby a new baby that's due in a few weeks. And I think about Joshua Aaron and his family and all the families in Israel that are sending their 18 and 19 year olds to the IDF, both uh, girls and boys. And uh, they have a happy life living in the land 
And now they live in the fear of their children being harmed in order to protect their country. Many Christian youth have also joined the IDF. And, uh, you know, Christians are raised in an environment of love your neighbor as yourself and love your enemies. Yet it is a righteous thing in war to kill those who threaten your people. So there's a time for peace and there's a time for war. There's a time, a time to kill and a time to heal. All of these things are part of the way life is in this place. And so as believers, we are called to be sober-minded, not giddy or foolish while the world is plunging into darkness. And at the same time, we are supposed to have an abiding joy that comes with the active anticipation of our Lord's coming. So there's a mourning that is pervasive and growing in the world, a mourning for the loss of our freedoms as we watch an ever-expanding society of reprobates taking control. And Yahweh has given us the Moadim. He's given us the appointed times or the feasts of the Lord. And these are memorials for Israel to recount God's faithfulness, to deliver them from bondage according to his promise. It's also a foreshadow of the ultimate redemption in the blood of Messiah Yeshua. So just as these feasts look back to something historical, there is a future prophetic uh, component. So the enemy also has his feasts. It is Hasatan that wants to be like Yahweh Elohim. So he set up feasts and paganism, which he has laid out all of his future plans, his version of prophecy. So we're going to talk about this, uh, this feast because I was I would never have gone this way, but the Lord led me to this, and I was stunned to discover uh, what I did. We're going to talk about this feast, this ancient uh, feast called Saturnalia. It's an ancient Roman festival, and it's a holiday in the honor of the god of Saturn, and it's held for seven days in December. The holiday was celebrated with a sacrifice at the temple of Saturn in the Roman Forum and a public banquet followed by a private gift giving, continual partying, and a carnival atmosphere that overturned Roman social norms. Gambling was permitted, and masters provided table service for their slaves, as it was seen as a time of liberty for both slaves and freedmen alike. Common custom was the election of a king of the Saturnalia, who would give orders to people which were to be followed and preside over the merrymaking. The poet Catullus called it the best of days. Like Saturnalia, Christmas during the Middle Ages was a time of ruckus, drinking, gambling, and overeating. In medieval France and Switzerland, a boy could be elected bishop for a day. The boy bishop's tenure ended during the evening vespers. This custom was common across Western Europe, but varied considerably by region. In some parts of France, during the boy bishop's tenure, the actual clergy would wear masks or dress in women's clothes, a reversal of roles in line with the, tr the traditional character of Saturnalia. So, uh, so it's kind of like this upside down kind of idea uh, where everything is backward. During the late medieval period and early Renaissance, many towns in England elected a Lord of Misrule. At Christmas time, he provide, presided over the Feast of Fools. Now, what does that have to do with Christmas? The Feast of Fools, what does the Bible say? That only a fool uh, says in his heart, there is no God. Mm -hmm. So this custom was sometimes associated with Twelfth Night or Epiphany. During the Protestant Reformation, reformers sought to revise or completely abolish such practices, which they regarded as popish. These efforts were largely successful, and in many places, these customs died out completely. The Puritans banned the Lord of Misrule in England, and the customs were largely forgotten. Saturnalia was the Roman equivalent to the earlier Greek holiday of Cronia, which was celebrated in late midsummer. 
and held a theological importance for some Romans who saw it as a restoration of the ancient golden age when the world was ruled by Saturn. Saturn is actually Hasatan. Some teach that uh, Satan and Lucifer are two different individuals, but that is not correct. There is one fallen angel that seduced the whole of creation to rebel against the creator. And so true the pattern, Satan is seeking uh, his golden age or his utopia for seven years. So how long was Saturnalia? Seven days. The Neoplatonist philosopher Porphyry interpreted the freedom associated with Saturnalia as symbolizing the freeing of souls into immortality. In Roman mythology, the golden age was when humans enjoyed the spontaneous bounty of the earth without labor in a state of innocence. The revelries of Saturnalia were supposed to reflect the conditions of the last mythical age, essentially when there was no law, so they could do as they pleased. The Greek equivalent was the Cronia, which was celebrated around mid-July to mid-August. The Argive festival of Hebristica, thought not, I'm sorry, though not directly related to the Saturnalia, involved a similar reversal of roles in which women would dress as men and men would dress as women. The first inhabitants of Italy were Aborigines, whose king Saturnus is said to have been a man of such extraordinary justice that no one was a slave in his reign or had any private property, but all things were common to all and, and undivided as one estate for the use of everyone, in memory of which way of life it has been ordered that at the Saturnalia, slaves would sit down with their masters at the entertainment, the rank of all being made equal. In Lucian's Saturnalia, it is Kronos himself who proclaims a festive season when it's lawful to be drunk and slaves have license to revile their lords. So the elements of this festival are chaos, hedonism, the descent into dissipation, into gluttony, drunkenness, sexual immorality, perversion, the undoing of God-given roles, women dressing as men and vice versa, and the wearing of masks, so the wearing of masks, so granted uh, the masks were theatrical in this instance, but I think that it is surely a shadow of the masking of the world's population as we saw with the epidemic, the, uh, the mock overthrow of government and authority because they were, you know, the uh, servants were allowed to uh, revile their, their uh, lords and masters and, uh, you know, bringing them all to the same level. So this is not about equality, but this is a kind of equity. The term equity is something that we find in the Great Reset. It is about fairness and justice that is distinguished from equality. Whereas equality means providing the same opportunity to all, equity means, uh, equity recognizes that we do not all start from the same place, and must acknowledge and make adjustments to imbalances. This is about the redistribution of everything, the redistribution of wealth, everything. So therefore in Saturn's utopia, there was no personal property. Everything belonged to the collective. This is build back better. It's the great reset. You will have nothing and you will be happy. The statue of Saturn at his main temple normally had its feet bound in wool, which was removed for the holiday as an act of liberation. And I, I thought about that, why wool? And I thought maybe this is a symbolic of the sheep that restrain him. Think about that. The, the restrainer is the spirit-filled believers on the earth. And as soon as we are removed, he will have his opportunity to do what he wants to do. So in this feast that he had, they took to that, that sheep fleece off of his feet to show that he was liberated. So upon the removal of the saints, darkness is 
liberated from the pit and chaos is released on the earth and darkness descends as the foolish, right? The feast of fools as the foolish await their king of misrule and they will celebrate it. Uh, they will celebrate not light, but they will celebrate enlightenment. And lastly, uh, Saturnalia was supposed to be a holiday from all forms of work. Schools were closed, exercise regimens were suspended, courts were not in session, no justice was administered, no declaration of war could be made. After the public rituals, observances continued at home. Does that not sound like lockdown to you? No. So don't forget that the prophetic doesn't have to play out exactly the same, only the elements have to be there. So even the devil's so-called prophetic shadows only paint just that. It's just a shadow of what would come. Saturnalian license also permitted slaves to disrespect their masters without the threat of punishment. It was a time for free speech. The Augustan poet Horace called it December Liberty. In two satires set during the Saturnalia, Horace has a slave offer sharp criticism to his master. Everyone knew, however, that the leveling of the, of the social hierarchy was temporary. It had limits. No social, social norms were ultimately threatened because the holiday would end. And so the weak and the small were emboldened to speak uh, freely, even to rebuff their masters. But this free speech was temporary. Today, everything is being stored up to use against the people. You know, what is considered free speech right now uh, will be used as evidence to prosecute people when our temporary free speech is taken away. You know, everything we do is recorded. They can play back every conversation you have on your phone, every text you ever made. All of these recordings that we do on Zoom, I'm sure that they have a copy. Uh, I watched this preacher in the UK and uh, he stands in the streets of London every week and sometimes smaller cities and he preaches the gospel. He preaches with boldness. He preaches with truth. And as he was preaching this week, uh, two female officers came to him and they said that they had a complaint from a citizen because he was being offensive. And uh, he was preaching and to make a point, he asked the question, where are the Muslim or the Jewish or the Mormon? And he listed a few others. Uh, where are the preachers? Where are they in the street telling you the way of salvation? Do they have a way of salvation? And his point was, they aren't out sharing the salvation of their God because there isn't one. Only Christianity offers a way to eternal life. And so in England, someone got their delicate feelings hurt when this minister uh, made a comparison of Christian faith versus worldly religions. And this is now serious enough to send out two officers to check out, you know, what he was saying. So freedom of speech is selective. If you are a part of a society that agrees with the lunacy that's going on, then you may say what you like. But if you are a Christian and you are speaking the truth, if you are uh, upholding biblical truth, then uh, you are in big trouble. So there is no reasonable con uh, conversation left. It is a circular argument. It's irrational and exasperating. And no matter how many times he tried to explain himself to these officers they were locked into this well but you offended them and you know you could refrain from using uh, other religions in your message and you know they're telling him now what to preach and how to preach because somebody might get their feelings hurt so if you have your feelings hurt that means that you need to you know have police defend you it used to be that not even your mother would go and defend you if you got your feelings hurt. It was, you know, buck up and go deal with it, grow up. But now they've created 
a nanny state. Everybody's a baby and they need the police to be their nannies and take care of them. So whether you're talking about gender or medical mandates or the environment, there is nothing rational anymore. The upside down and chaotic, abs absurd world of Satan, where good is evil, evil is good, all are lawless and do what is right in their own eyes. The Saturnalia reflects the contradictory nature of the deity Saturn himself. There are joyful and utopian aspects of careless well-being side by side with the disquieting elements of threat and danger. Is that not exactly what we see? Um, this, uh, I don't know if he's a rabbi. Uh, his name is Y. Avoda Zara claimed that the etymology of Saturnalia means hidden hatred, a reference to the hatred of Esau harbored for Jacob. And uh, the rabbis believe that Esau had fathered Rome, that he was the uh, progenitor of what became Rome. So just as our Lord revealed his great plan of salvation in the feast of the Lord, the, the devil was busy with a counterfeit revealing his plans for the destruction of the world uh, in, within his own pagan feasts. A couple of weeks ago, Glenn Beck had posted a video that grabbed my attention. He said that he had sensed a spiritual season change about eight months ago. Um, he was talking about um, when he was younger, some years ago, someone had given him some spiritual advice. He was asking, he didn't say exactly what it was, but he was asking about, you know, how am I going to know when the time is, is there? And the person told him, just watch the trees. Well, you know, that's the words of Jesus, right? When he said to observe the fig tree and all the trees. And uh, he said that he uh, was told that when the time is right, you'll know. So he felt strongly that seasons were changing, that we were in a deeper and uh, uh, more dangerous time, that um, real problems were at our door. And then he felt the change again this summer. He said in the last eight to nine weeks, and he said he could be wrong, but he thinks that what he's feeling is this climate bill that has been uh, passed in Congress. He said, this will change everything and it will make a new and dangerous America. The only thing that they can do to really polish this off is to declare a national climate emergency. And if they do, we're done for. So, you know, the uh, whole lockdown stuff, that was just the dry run. But if they do a climate emergency, that could change everything. And uh, literally they could keep us in our homes and you wouldn't be able to use your vehicle. Um, a lot of things could happen. And we know that that's gonna be the extreme end of it. So we know that uh, sea change uh, is the means to push through the rest of their agenda. And it's behind uh, the economy, the current ongoing agricultural catastrophe that they have engineered in order to murder half the world's population with starvation. It is their main political agenda that drives their war on energy. They've reduced our stores of fuel by putting it out there for public use to ease the inflation that they claim doesn't exist. But that is set aside for emergency use, even for the military for war. So if that's depleted, and we get cut off from our uh, offshore oil suppliers, what then? We do have uh, resources, but it would take nearly a year to refine our own resources and months more to meet the needs of our nation. And uh, that's if they were even willing to do it. So now some you know, may say that a topic like this doesn't belong in the pulpit. But this isn't about politics. This is a satanic agenda. And we're supposed to be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. 
It's the unseen realm at work using their little human puppets to accomplish what they've planned for thousands of years. The prophet Habakkuk appealed to the Lord with two complaints as he watched the war machine of Babylon advancing on his nation. Habakkuk 1 at verse 2. Yahweh, how long will I cry and you will not hear? I cry out to you, violence, and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and look at perversity? For destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and contention rising up. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, justice comes out perverted. Verse 12. Aren't you from everlasting? Yahweh, my God, my Holy One, we shall not die. Yahweh, you have appointed him, the king of Babylon, for judgment. You, rock, have established him to punish. You who have purer eyes than to see evil, who cannot look on perversity, why do you tolerate those who deal treacherously and keep silent when the wicked swallows up the man who is more righteous than he? So Habakkuk answered his own questions in his complaint. Babylon was brought against God's people to punish them for their evil and their rebellion. God is long suffering and we might ask the same questions, but in truth, Yah has watched this country sink lower than any of us thought was possible in the shortest amount of time. If he brings Russia, China, or really just the new world order, is it not because we have deserted him and mocked him, raising rainbow flags to provoke him with, every, with the very covenant that he swore never to destroy the earth again with a flood. They lie to us incessantly about sea change, making every summer spike in temperature some catastrophic anomaly. In fact, it's all very normal temperature variants. I remember uh, summers that were cool and wet and some that were very dry and very hot. This is the norm. It's always been this way. They exploit news reports from India about heat waves because we don't understand the extreme heat that they deal with in a normal situation. It's very hot compared to us. They're manipulating weather, true enough. They cause storm cells. They use energy weapons to start forest fires. They blame it on sea change. But they do not understand that God is not mocked. They have brought the charge against the creator that his work is faulty. They portray the ineffable God like a demigod from the comics or Greek mythology that is drunk with power, but has no real wisdom or understanding, foolishly setting a plan in motion with no concern or care about the eventual outcome, no vision for every possible scenario. They claim that we will run out of resources, that we are overpopulated on the earth. Our planet cannot sustain us. That the very food that the Lord provided for us is now the source of our environmental destruction. God said not to eat insects, that they're unclean, that it's not food. And yet they see this as the very answer to end the world's hunger that they are now creating. God is not mocked. He has clearly said that those who commit abomination live with a death sentence hanging over their head. They are in judgment and they are responsible for their own blood. The example of Sodom being a wicked city with great sin against the Lord indulged in sexual immorality and abomination. They serve as an example by, an undergoing, by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. What is different now is the same thing is happening the whole world. It's not just in one place. It's not just here in America. It is more than um, 
the decline of the so-called American empire. You know, they talk about, oh, well, we're like Rome or any other great empire, but it's not just us. That's what's different. This is the end of the age. So what if Yahweh uses the very thing that they have weaponized, sea change, global warming, to demonstrate to them that he alone is God, that he is in control, that he is the truth, and every man be a liar? What if instead of global warming, we are entering into an ice age of sorts? We are in unseasonable coolness this August. Meteorologists are beginning to see signs of fall already being revealed. And so I watched a video on YouTube. Um, the channel is Appalachian Homestead. Uh, the woman is a believer and she's a homesteader. She lives off the grid. And she was talking about the early signs of fall that they're noticing on their homestead. And nature tells us how to prepare for winter. In Ohio, we have, you know, the Woolly Bear Festival and, you know, these caterpillars, uh, you know, we consider it mythology, but I think it's God who gives us these little barometers, these little indicators. The width of the brown stripe on their coat tells us whether the uh, uh, winter will be mild or severe. So the wider the brown stripe, the milder, and the more black on the uh, caterpillar, it will be more severe. So God gave us signs in nature and agriculture. And she started talking about the persimmon seeds. And she seemed to uh, almost be prophesying. She said that we need to be prepared. It's going to be a dark winter. And, you know, that's funny because that was a phrase that Joe Biden was using last year. You know, a dark winter. It's like, where did this come from? And I know that there's a lot more to that. That is like a code name. And so she said, it's going to be a dark winter. You can take it figuratively, literally, metaphorically, all of it above. But apart from an economic or worldwide pandemic, an economic collapse or worldwide pandemic, she said, it will most likely be a hard winter in ter terms of the supply chain, having what you need to survive it. So look, you look at the, uh, the seed of the persimmon and inside the seed is a shape. And that shape is either a fork, a spoon or a knife. And uh, if you see, let's see, if the kernel is spoon shaped, expect plenty of snow to shovel. If it's fork shaped, plan on a mild winter with powdery light snow. If the kernel is knife shaped, expect frigid winds that will cut like a blade. So as she was talking, I began to remember the prophecy from Rabbi Kaduri that included something about a persimmon. I mean, that's not a common uh, word that you hear very often. And so I looked at it again. And the statements by Rabbi Kaduri uh, reference excerpts from the ancient book the Covenant of the Persimmon by Kabbalist Rabbi Sasan Hai Shoshani, who Kaduri said was known as the prophet of Egypt. Shoshani said that there will come on the day that two ministers win the government in the land of Israel. Both their names will be Benjamin and neither of them will succeed in establishing their government or kingship. Now, my goodness, that is right off the pages of our, new, our news. And uh, that day came when Benjamin Netanyahu and Benjamin uh, or Benny Gantz, uh, funny, we were talking about Gantz earlier, right? Shared the seat of the prime minister. So he says, on that day, know and understand that the King Messiah already stands at the doorway. And on the Sabbath afterwards, it, he will come and be revealed. So Shoshani's statement continues, understand this and remember it. So he's not, you know, um, Messianic rabbi. He's a uh, Kabbalist, actually. And so uh, it might just be co coincidence that I came across this persimmon video with this Appalachian lady. 
or maybe the Lord was getting my attention to give me a heads up so that we would be ready. Since 2020, the rabbi said that the Messiah is at the door. That's when that election occurred was in 2020. So why would he use that particular language that he's at the door? That's new covenant language. Mark 13, 28. Now from the fig tree, learn this parable. When the branch has now become tender and produces its leaf, you know that the summer is near. Even so, you also, when you see these things coming to pass, know that it's near at the doors. Uh, most certainly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things happen. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So think about it. Um, you know, this is Israel's time of redemption. And so their most respected rabbis uh, are getting dreams and visions and prophecy from the Lord to prepare Israel for the coming of Messiah. Now, Rabbi Kaduri, before he died, he knew the name of the Messiah was Yeshua. He knew it was him. But Shoshani, we don't know that. And so he is speaking in language. If he's prophesying, that he's prophesying by the Holy Spirit. He may not even realize that these words were from the new covenant. James 5, 9 says, don't grumble brothers against one another so that you won't be judged. Behold, the judge stands at the door. So Yeshua said to his own, to the saints, behold, I have set before you an open door that no one can shut. So if he's at the door, then he is ready to open that door for us. On the eve of the year 5780, this is the prophecy from Kaduri, which was 2020, the year of corrections, he called it. There will not be a government in Israel for an extended period, and the various camps will quarrel much about a decision on either side. And that is exactly what has happened. Uh, even Netanyahu was put out last summer. Uh, he was, you know, ousted um, unlawfully. They set up a whole different government, appointed prime ministers, not elected them. That was never done before. And uh, this has been a very accurate prophecy. So even this summer, the government was again dissolved, and they are facing the fifth election in four years on November 1st. So in June of 2019, the Lord gave me the word about the heartland. And uh, he used all these terms that were from the TV show, Heartland. Uh, every term was from the TV show, but it all applied to what was going on in Israel. So he gave me the words Heartland, Equestrian Connection, and uh, this had to do with um, the horsemen in Zechariah chapter one. And then he said the fall grand finale and annexed. So President Trump was negotiating a deal that would allow Israel to annex all of the settlements in the West Bank. And while it also gave the Palestinians a limited self-rule over the Gaza Strip, chunks of the West Bank and other far-flung areas, it also grants Israel virtually all of East Jerusalem. So he was acknowledging Israel's sovereignty over the heartland. And this was the equestrian connection. This is what would lead to a false peace in Zechariah chapter one. The annexation was tabled for a time. And then out of the blue, uh, Jared came with this whole other deal uh, that resulted in the Abraham Accords with the UAE and that stopped the annexation. So instead of taking back the God-given land that Israel instead sought favor with their enemies. That was not pleasing to God. And that action changed everything. In June of 2020, the Lord spoke Saudi Sally to me. And then uh, much to my surprise in the midsummer, the negotiations with Israel and the Saudis began to fulfill that word, but I didn't understand the Sally part. And then they signed the Abraham Accords on the 15th of September in 2020. 
the covenant with Abraham is found in Genesis 15. So there was the 15 and the 15. And then to top it all off, Hurricane Sally made landfall the same night. So the hurricane was Yahweh's response to those accords. So out of this came the Abrahamic house of faith that we've been talking about in Dubai. And it's the prototype of the one world religion. The repercussion was much more than the hurricane. President Trump lost the election one way or another. And the country is now being punished with a socialist takeover. So Kaduri's prophecy continues. Then on Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year itself, they will fight in heaven, the, whole, the holy side against the side of evil, and God and his entourage will decide between them. And this is all I can say, and from here I swore not to reveal more secrets and hidden things. So did he realize that he was speaking about Daniel chapter 12 at verse 1? At that time, Michael will stand up, the great prince, who stands for the children of your people. And there will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. At that time, your people will be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. And also Revelation 12, 7. There was a war in the sky. Michael and his angels made war on the dragon. The dragon and his angels made war. They didn't prevail, neither was a place found for them any more in heaven. The great dragon was thrown down, the old serpent, he who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And so, um, you know, this is uh, the, the time that he's saying, this is about where we are. And, you know, it's also interesting that uh, this week, I started to hear about the uh, Space Force, right? We've got this whole new branch of military called the Space Force. And uh, usually, every branch had their own part. Like, the, you know, like you've got, the, you have the Air Force, and then you've got the Navy, and you've got the Marines, but they all have jets. They all have pilots, right? They all do aircraft. And uh, this is the first time that all of the uh, different branches of military are going to answer in the Space Force to one, it's just like one, um, I don't know what you call them, military leader, okay? They're not going to be individual aspects of that, you know, Space Force, but it's one thing. And it's coming from all the different branches. So they're kind of like converging in Space Force. Why? Because they're anticipating some kind of warfare in the heavens. Okay, they're getting ready for that. So um, Shoshani then speaks about the Sabbath afterwards. He seems to imply uh, the sab sabbatical year. So September of 2021 till right now, till 2022, was, uh, uh, this is a uh, Shemitah, we're in it right now. And on that day, he said, no one understand that the King Messiah stands at the doorway and on the Sabbath afterwards, he will come and be revealed. So if in 2020, uh, that fulfillment, because we had the two Benjamins being prime minister at the same time, that was 2020, the Sabbath afterward, Messiah will come and be revealed. So that could mean uh, that before we get to Yom Teruel, before we get to the new year at the end of September, you know, he's saying that possibly Messiah is going to be revealed. So whether that means he's going to, you know, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ where he comes for his people, or he's going to be revealed to the, the uh, people of Israel, I don't know. But I would like to thank you that it is Messiah's return. So he says to understand and remember it. So are we being positioned in this season for Messiah's return? So all these details help us to pinpoint the season. We don't know the day or the hour, but we can know a season. The Farmer's Almanac said that this winter is going to be very cold and snowy, even in early winter. 
So think about this, you know, there's that persimmon and she saw a shovel. So that meant that uh, it was gonna be lots of snow. So the almanac goes on to say, depending on where you live, this could be the best of winters or memorable for all the wrong reasons. Um, one half of the US will be dealing with bone chilling cold and loads of snow, which is what the persimmon is saying while the other half may feel like winter never really arrives. While we won't release our full forecast until August 30th, here's a hint. Our predictions for this winter will divide a nation. Now, what in the world did they just say? So is this language accidental? Is this coincidental? Climate change, they continue to talk about global warming how the coasts will be overwhelmed by rising sea levels. However, the elite continue to buy multi-million dollar properties on the coast and they are not concerned. The same ones who are shouting about climate change, the same ones are zipping around in their private jets, leaving a massive carbon footprint. So in 2008, the Lord had given me that extensive word and this portion of it pertains to the time we're in. Uh, this was April 8th of 2008. This was, nobody knew who President Obama was because he wasn't elected. He was really not very famous. But now uh, this is what the Lord said to me at that time. Now, no, a radical change is coming for America. Fair business practice, fair tax laws, freedom of religion, freedom of speech. No fear will rule here. I am has blessed America above every nation and I will be glorified in her. Those who predict her demise are not my prophets. Those who uphold her are ministers of truth and righteousness. So 08 was the election year that Obama came to be president. We had eight years of deconstruction and God was giving us hope for our country that it wouldn't be the end yet. He said revival would come and harvest the world will see and want it for a season, but not for long. So truly there was a worldwide revival of nationalism. They even use that language in the news. Um, many countries followed President, Trump, President Trump's lead of America first, uh, countering the globalist movement. It slowed them down temporarily, but it was short-lived, just as the Lord said, it was short-lived. By 2020, darkness had secured uh, the power seats with all the right individuals that would sell out the people and do whatever the global government wanted. So then the Lord said, when the climate changes, I will take you all home that are ready, that are born again. So here we are again with climate change. I didn't know much about climate change back in 08. I didn't pay attention to it. So when he said this, it kind of, you know, was like, well, what does that mean? And now all we talk about is climate change. Talking about a literal climate change, is it getting colder sooner than normal, which is what they are kind of seeing, the trend? Or could this be a political climate or even the climate bill? So for me, I see all of this as significant. It's all falling at the same time. Uh, we have to listen to the conversation that is going on out there. And uh, it, it is significant for us. And this is how, you know, these are the things we're to watch for. These are the changes in society. These are the, how we know where society is on the timeline because uh, we can't go too much further. They are uh, ready to pass a bill that would basically federalize marriage. So it would no longer be up to the state. So you could marry whatever you want or as many as you want. And, uh, you know, uh, these, this is lawlessness. This is when you have the Lord of Misrule watching over everything and, uh, you know, making laws that are absurd and wicked. And uh, it's really not a place that we can live anymore as we are becoming more and more like Lot who was vexed in his righteous soul every day as he watched the wickedness and the lawlessness, uh, the perversion of the city he lived in. And that is what we are seeing, not just in America, 
but all over the world. And uh, it is time for us to go. So 1 Peter 1.13, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, yet your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen.